Art Centric Podcast with Rafi and Klee. Hola, you amazing artist. It's Rafi and Klee. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Are we going to do that over? <laughs> no. Did you forget what you were doing? This podcast is about embracing the awkward. So oh, I just, okay. I figured I'd put us all on the spot that's, by being weirdly silent. That's great. That's great. All right. So we're starting off this podcast already being awkward. And as Clee said, we are doing a podcast about embracing the awkward, which I think is really important, especially for us artists that are extremely introverted, which is like 99.99%. I'll just put this out there straight away. With being an introvert or an artrovert or a human being navigating an art career and living a life of any kind, there's already numerous things to concern yourself with. Awkwardness should not be one. You should just fly your awkward flag that is a great and call it a day. That is a great way of putting it. That <laughs> that pretty much encompasses what this podcast is going to be about. And uh, yeah, so we could end it here. There you go. You've got enough on your plate. Don't worry about your personality. <laughs> <laughs> and if you guys are listening to this at home, we have our amazing rogues here. So if you hear us reading a comment, it's not because we are speaking to ourselves, although we do speak to ourselves. Yeah. A whole lot. I was just doing that 10 minutes ago in yeah. preparation for this podcast. That is true. <laughs> that is true. Liv says, I love that quote. Uh, yeah, thank you. It is good. Valerie says, I know awkward. <laughs> <laughs> so we are... Um, talking to ourselves but we're also talking to our amazing rogue community who are here with us and they will hopefully be chiming in with their questions and anecdotes and stories related to the topic of being awkward yeah and some of them right now as Ginny, are doing their taxes mm -hmm. um and you know there's nothing more um awkward than doing your taxes, especially when you're an artist and things don't fall into the categories this of, is true. of normal, right? So in my mind, I'm like, there's awkward and then there's normal. Yeah, yeah. For example, when you are an artist who sells your art according to like the paperwork that you fill out when you establish, you become a retail peddler because <laughs> <laughs> that's what it's called because they don't know what else to call you. Yeah. Yeah. There are, there aren't very many, like I was thinking about that this morning because I was filling out some paperwork and they were like, uh, you know, are you employed or other? <laughs> And I'm oh, like, what? <laughs> I am other all the way, all day, every day. It's funny because I think that awkward is a thing that is, you know, kind of like what Tish is saying here. Awkward is sexy, just like nerdiness and bow ties. <laughs> yeah. But then there is awkward and there is rude. Rude is not sexy. Indeed. Agreed. And Indeed. there is a very, very m notable difference between rude and awkward i think i think there is something really important about embracing your awkward especially um especially as a creative like getting out there right because we're showing off our stuff that in in one sense or the other could be considered embarrassing depending on who the audience is what the audience is right I think about when I when I first started showing my art and my dad was like, what is this shit? You know, it's like it was. It, Thanks, it, dad. Yeah. And I would say that one of the biggest things that kept me from pursuing my art career was feeling awkward, being embarrassed of like, here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm pouring my heart out. I'm going to show this artwork. And my dad comes up and he's like, what is this shit? You know, and, and like immediately you feel embarrassed and you're you're feeling awkward about the whole situation. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people avoid situations like that, avoid awkward situations because they're afraid of how they're going to look. Yeah. Well, one one of the reasons you wouldn't embrace your, I guess the main reason you wouldn't embrace your awkward side is that we're kind of biologically hardwired to seek acceptance from our, from other humans uh, because we're a social creature. Do you think that we're biologically hardwired to ex for acceptance or do you think that it's trained, right? 
Because I think of, you know, I've, I've got like a billion kids and um, <laughs> I've got four. I don't have a billion. I've got four kids and watching my kids interact with one another and other people when they were like little blobs that couldn't take care of themselves, you know, there, there was this connection of love Mm -hmm. and want. And when they wanted something, they screamed, Mm -hmm. you know, there, there comes that point as a parent where you start to recognize like whether or not it's a real uh, cry or or alligator tears, alligator tears. It was like, "Eh," just because they want attention and stuff like that. And the thing is that as a kid, um, you embrace doing what you're doing. You don't feel embarrassed. I think mm-hmm. that you start to feel embarrassed once you learn what that means. Yeah. So I would say embarrassment is trained. I think um, wanting to be accepted by other humans is probably biologically hardwired in us. And I would say that a kid's definition of what's acceptable social behavior is much broader uh, than an adult's right because what we learn is to be embarrassed right we learn to be embarrassed we learn that we have to be quiet right you know don't make a big fuss about it when don't... we go here don't ask for anything don't even say anything yeah. right <laughs> and i and i think about that because like i said watching my kids i think it's not acceptance right i think what i'm what i'm getting stuck on here is that kids are wanting acceptance i think it's later on that kids want acceptance you know they they might have a parent that's having a bad day and that kid is going to in um, if anybody can't tell i'm talking about myself that kid is going to draw a little picture right of mommy with a with a heart and be like here you go mommy and then you know the either she's going to respond in a positive way or her drama is what it is. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that that's where you start getting trained for that acceptance. Right. And really when we're talking about acceptance, we're talking about validation. I think watching kids become friends. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think there, there are as many hoops to jump through. Exactly. Kids are far more accepting and kids are also prone to assume that they are liked and accepted before they're trained out of that. I think that that right there hits the nail on the head. Like there is no reason for somebody not to like me, right? Right. I remember being a kid before I got trained out of it, you know, just navigating life, assuming that everyone would treat me well, that everyone was friendly and that I got along with everybody. Yeah. Um, Zara said survival. Y- yeah. 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 It is a survival mechanism. Yeah, Cause she says I'm leaning towards trained kids. Don't give a damn. Yeah. No kids under a certain age. They like each other and they settle their disputes easily. <laughs> I mean, that was interesting. I watched a uh, study that they had done. I read a study and then I watched a video that was based on this study about kids. Right. And they showed, like the adults coming in and there was a disagreement because one of the kids wanted a toy, but it was the other kid's toy. And like they got into the little, the kids got into an argument. And then shortly thereafter, like five minutes later, they're just playing again, right? It's not a big deal. But the parents were still upset over the situation. And it really, it, it it's a, a great display of the fact that a lot of you know, uh, holding a grudge and all that stuff where like, I'm never going to forget this. Ruminating. Ruminating about something like that's really the stuff that is trained into us because that's really the way that a lot of people interact, whether it's, you know, natural human nature or whatever. But the fact is that like a lot of it is really trained into us. And when I think about why there people are afraid to be awkward in front of other people, I think that that's part of that social acceptance uh, that is something that is uh, made up. It's a construct. It totally is. That is based on whether or not like, oh, you know, being nervous. I think about going to an event that we went to and I was extremely awkward at this event. Right. And the reason that I was feeling awkward at this event was because um it had to do with the the high society people. It was like an art event with high society people. 
And of course I'm going in there and I'm feeling all grungy and like whatever. So instead of just being myself, I went out and got a suit that didn't fit right, but it was appropriate for the occasion. I didn't feel comfortable. Instead of wearing my bandana, I, you know, went with a hat that would go with the suit. And instead of wearing my Converse, um, you know, because my style would be, yeah, I'm going to dress up. I'll wear a tuxedo suit and jacket with a t-shirt, Converse, and my bandana, and I'm totally comfortable. I go to this event, and I'm already feeling uncomfortable in my skin, right? And, and then I start feeling awkward. And the reason was because I wasn't being myself. I thought that being myself wasn't good enough for the event. Mm. And I think that it's that judgment, that perceived judgment, that really causes us to face things in an awkward way that's not positive. I could have gone and been completely awkward and been myself and been fine, would have had a great time. But going and trying to be something that you're not, I think that that's where a lot of that awkwardness really comes in and is not a healthy version of being awkward. Definitely. I mean, we're we're essentially taught what is unacceptable and you can see that that varies um, if you look across different cultures and different social groups. What's acceptable and unacceptable varies. Yeah. So while I think that we are hardwired to 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 want to be loved and accepted, uh, we're we're not hardwired to feel shame and to feel like we're unacceptable. But we are taught that. And what exactly is awkwardness? Yeah. Right. Awkwardness, I think, at its core, is visible, uh, detectable, unsuredness, insecurity about who you are. Right. Tish said, I think we all at a primal level want to be loved and liked, but we learn bad and good ways to attain that love and like. And some of us are still unsure of what's good and bad, hence awkward. That's that's a really good way of putting it. Yeah. Lith says, some of it is how the parents raise their kids too. I could rant on, but I want... Well, Lith... That is, that's one of those sins of the father gets passed down to the son and the mother and all that stuff. That's one of those things where it's like, if your parents were not great at raising you, chances are their parents were shit. And chances are their parents were even more shit at raising kids. And the truth is, when we're talking about generational things, there can be a disconnect there, right? I think about it because as a parent... um, I think about my role as a parent, and it really is just to support my children's growth. Um, Now, the way that I was raised wasn't like that. It was like, I know better than you, and you better do what I tell you to do, you know, and that's just not. And I think that that's another one of those things that gets trained in there because you're dealing with uh, a good way to put this is every single one of us that has gotten older at one point or another, has the realization that we don't know shit. And we're technically adults now. And we're technically adults now. (laughs) And then we have the realization that our parents were the same age that we are now. Mm Mm-hmm. When and they were telling us when that they, they were knew telling it all. us that they knew it all, and I'm like, they didn't know shit either. So it's like, but it, it I think it's one of those things where like it just, it, there's always an improvement. I think about my father and my father, with as much as I joke around and I say, you know, like he came up and he said, this work is shit. My dad is extremely supportive. Um, he is a hundred times more supportive than his father was. Definitely. So it's one of those things where I think there, even even if there isn't that awareness level, I think things do get a little bit better as long as there isn't, you know, um, really dramatic. Some people are just uh, full of themselves. Uh, a lot of people like to call that narcissism. And so like when you're dealing with somebody like that, you're definitely going to pick up a lot of baggage. And I think that in dealing with social interactions we forget that everyone has baggage. Mm -hmm. Everyone has baggage. Everyone is going to an event and they're nervous to be there and socialize. And, you know, there are different, you know, we'll we'll call them the extroverts. The extroverts go, they're not socializing. They're just talking. 
You know, they're just talking and filling up the time and filling up space because that's what their insecurity is. They can't, there, there cannot be a quiet moment um, because then they feel really insecure about themselves. And then for introverted people, like, you know, sometimes it's just too much. You don't, it's like, yo, just back off a little bit. And then you're feeling awkward in those situations. But, but there is that awkwardness in both sides of, of having to interact with other people and being afraid of how they're going to look at you. Yeah, that's what it boils down to, right? Being afraid of how someone's going to look at you, being afraid of getting something wrong, saying something wrong, doing something wrong. Because anytime you go into a new environment or a new group or a new anything, you it's a bunch of unknowns, right? You don't know what the what the overall mood is going to be, what people's belief systems look like, what they consider unacceptable and acceptable so it's like it's venturing into the unknown and that's the thing you guys like all of that stuff is stuff that even if you're not thinking about it in the foreground let's say you're going to have an art event and you're going to show your work or you're going to get on stage and play your music or you're going to share a video or you're going to share anything out there right immediately all of those moving parts are there somewhere in the background and you may not be completely aware of exactly what it is but those are the things that are making you nervous and really it all boils down to um acceptance whether or not you're going to be rejected or accepted and there comes a point when you get very used to clean i put ourselves out there a lot we we do in-person events, we do virtual events, we put out videos, podcasts, uh, music, artwork, jewelry, blogs. We share our opinion, our thoughts, and all that stuff constantly. Once you get to a place where you are more comfortable sharing who you are and what you do, you realize that there are going to be people out there that reject you. Um, based on their own personal reasons, they could reject you because of your face. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't, I don't like your face. I've had people tell me that. Um, and it's something that I have no control over. The only thing that I have control over is just doing something or being somewhere and just being myself, being who I am. Yeah. I want to talk about this for a minute because this is a huge thing that I feel like leads people to feel insecurity and awkwardness. And I think it's at the core of people pleaser syndrome. And I'm going to refer back to something my grandmother used to tell me when I was a kid, which was, Clee, just be the sweet, kind girl you are and everyone will like you. Now that sounds really nice on the surface. And I loved my grandma and she was amazing. But the thing is that what she meant by that was, Clee, don't stir the pot. Don't say anything that's controversial. Don't say, don't disagree with people. Don't stir the pot. Basically, if you want everyone to like you, just be agreeable. Well, that led to raging people pleaser syndrome for me and the belief that everyone should like you. And I'm sorry, but that's just not true. No matter how agreeable you are, not everyone's going to like you. And the idea that everyone should like you and that if someone doesn't like you, that it's something wrong inherently with you is total bull garbage. Yep. We're not all Betty White. And I guarantee you that Betty White had people that oh, didn't yeah. like her. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Even though she was amazing. Mary Flynn said, I feel like that all the time around my art. Awkward, yeah, and 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 like, oh, I don't know what I'm gonna talk about. And art's so <clears throat> personal, yeah, and sharing it can be so vulnerable that it's an extra level of that. But that idea that we need to be liked by everyone is part of the problem. It is part of the problem. It is a big part of the problem. And the thing is that your grandmother came from an era where a lot of that got passed down into this era as well of yeah. what will the neighbors think. Right. If you argue, don't argue too loud. Yeah. Right. No, you know, so no one can. She meant well. Her heart was in the right place. But, right? It's, but, but it was her insecurities. And I think that that's the biggest thing is that a lot of insecurities get passed down to us. And a lot of it is unspoken insecurities. Right. When you're a kid, you are a sponge absorbing stuff i've told my kids before like listen i apologize <clears throat> i'm i have my insecurities and my baggage and guess what i passed them down to you so you gotta deal with them 
on your own time. If I've grown in my experience and I've learned how to face these things, you come to me. If I have any answers, I'll tell you what my experience is. But other than that, like, listen, we all we all get the baggage. And it, some of it is just stuff that you absorb. Mm-hmm. You're a sponge. You absorb it. You see somebody. If, if somebody is telling you, you know, you got to think of the way that we absorb information, especially when we're kids, right? So you're a kid and your mother yells at you and tells you, you shouldn't lie. Lying is bad. Lying is horrible, right? Don't lie. And then five minutes later, the phone rings and you answer it. And it's somebody that your mother doesn't want to speak to. And she st- she's like, don't tell them I'm not here. Tell them I'm not here. Immediately, your little brain is going to try and make sense of that, right? So, okay, lying is bad, but... It's okay to lie if... Blah, blah, it's blah, okay blah. to lie if you want to get out of something that you don't want to do. Right. And that's really the way that we absorb information. It's not the things that people told us. It is us observing the world. And unfortunately, in our process of absorbing the world, there is a lot of stuff out there, a lot of stuff out there that sometimes we don't even think about. And so when we get approached or we decide that we're going to put ourselves out there, um, a lot of that stuff is just floating in the background and it's it, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. The way that people interact and a lot of the rules of engagement that are out there are just dumb. They don't make any sense. And no. so like you have all these contradictory ideas that's set up in your brain and it's like, what am, what am I supposed to? And then you get nervous and you feel awkward and you feel weird and, and you know, you don't want to be awkward. But again, that question. What really is awkward? What is what is normal? What is acceptable? What is acceptable? Have having an art career, pursuing an art career, it can be like one of the scariest ways to face awkwardness, but honestly, also having an art career and putting yourself out there and hearing the criticism and hearing from people who find you unacceptable for one reason or another is actually the best thing for it. Like doing YouTube uh, doing shows, doing markets, hearing people's uh, comments about your work and you as a person for for a decade, it's actually really great because you come to discover that like you could be the same person at an art show and meet 20 different people and they have 20 vastly different opinions of you and it's like... <laughs> Yeah, you have no control. It kind of relieves the burden because it's like, well, I can really only be the one person that I am. And trying to be a chameleon so that you um, have the semblance of like acceptance by all, like that's exhausting. You can't keep that up long term. It is exhausting. And it's a detriment to a creative person because you might have a song that 90% of the people that listen to it, maybe they don't like. You may have a uh, painting that you do or a work of art that 90% of the people that look at it, they don't like writing a book 90%. But there's those 10% of those people that are like you, that if you created something that you enjoyed and you really, really like, then it's those 10% that are going to attach to it. Other than that, you might have 90% of the population telling you that sucks We don't like it. Mm -hmm. And as an artist who puts themselves out there, you get to face that rejection head on and you get to choose what it is that that's going to mean to you. And it's understanding like, yeah, not everybody's going to like it. And some people are going to like it and maybe more than others or maybe less than others. But like either way, am I going to create this thing and am I going to allow myself to feel like, I'm less than, or am I just going to blaze my own trail and allow my 10% to find me? Right. Gobbles Gossip said, and never even would have thought to even try to make music on my, without my husband's encouragement and continuously bringing it up for a decade that I could make music and should. I totally get that, Gobbles Gossip. I found myself in the same position after leaving the bands that I was in 
20 years ago or however long it's been now and and struggling with that for almost a decade about making music on my own or in a new format um yeah and a lot of times it's just giving yourself permission to do the damn thing. Mary said, so funny, when I was a teacher, I could talk all day in front of groups of kids and parents, but as an artist, it's hard for me to discuss my art with other people. Talking about your art, I think, is probably one of the biggest sources of perceived awkwardness in the yeah. art world. Yeah. And it, I think it's because we, just like we've been talking about so far in this podcast, we think we're going to get it wrong somehow. You can't get it wrong. You created it. <laughs> and I, I ask myself, right, as, as let's say that I'm on the flip side of that and I'm a patron at an art show and I'm talking to the artist. What would I rather have? Would I rather have a slightly awkward, maybe slightly nervous artist being genuine with me about like, well, I'm a nerd. So like this conversation is going to be quite nerdy in nature <laughs> or just understanding that they're awkward and nervous, but them being real with me rather than putting on a facade of like a uh, fakery. I don't know. Yeah. Right. I would rather talk to the authentic, awkward nerd than the feigned art world expert. And that's one of the reasons that I posted the video that I posted yesterday of uh, a, a student sent me questions about a work of art. And what I did was instead of like responding uh, via email, I decided to just turn the camera on and then look at the questions and answer the questions in real time. Right. And with that particular work, I hadn't uh, it's the no strings attached with that particular work. I didn't I had it. I had created that years earlier. Um, so in that moment, I had to sit there and like look at the work and really investigate. Well, what am I feeling about this? And realizing, like, I'm not going to get it wrong. It's my art. Like, whatever whatever comes out of my mouth in this moment, that's that's what my truth is about the work right then and there when I'm investigating it. Does it have a deeper meaning so, at some other times in my life? Maybe. But, like, really, all you could do is right off the top of your head is just describe, well, well this is what I like about it or this is what. And it's not, I think... What makes that situation awkward is, right, that we have this idea that you're supposed to talk about your art in a very, like... In a certain way. Certain right? way. It, yeah. And it's it's got to be... you got to use certain words and all that stuff. I remember a few years ago, we put out a video where I was making fun of that, where I was saying, like, it doesn't have to be that way, right? You don't have to be all hoity-toity, artistic, like, oh, well, this is the meaning of the blah, 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 and all that stuff. And I made that voice, and somebody got very offended because apparently academic artists sound like man, man you have to blah 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 and i was like that is not what i was saying no and in that, that was, video whatsoever that was not the point we were illustrating i remember that video that was the video where i had stumbled across the random art phrase generator uh yep. that makes up nice sounding uh critiques of yep. artwork that don't actually that mean don't anything. actually mean anything and a lot of times when you read those like those artist statements that are like that they don't mean anything and it's done on purpose i think about the invisible sculpture the invisible sculpture uh there was an artist that released the invisible sculptures and then i decided that i was going to do the same thing and my entire uh artist statement on that didn't mean anything like it was, you know, about air and empty space and the meaning of life and all that stuff. It and was it's so like, pretentious. It was extremely pretentious. But that's the thing. You don't have to be pretentious when you're talking about your art. No. In fact, most people don't like that. Um, Tish said some of my own awkwardness comes from the idea that I need to be perfect to be accepted. Exactly. So this is exactly it. Yeah. As I get older, I'm able to say F that. And be me. It's hard, but I'm a shot of whiskey, not a cup of tea. Exactly. I love that, Tish. Clover said, haters mean you've made it. You made someone feel a strong emotion. Yes, yes. Clover. Yes, And indeed. I love that way of looking at it. Um, Leith said, when I started my creative writing studies, I was afraid people wouldn't like my work. So I changed the subject until one day I'm like, what the heck? Let's just give it a try. Sweet. Exactly. What the heck? So... I have partially embraced um, using certain terminology that is totally unacceptable for my uh, for my medium. That right, I will tell people that I effing love rocks. Okay, yeah. For anybody who knows anything about gemstones and minerals, 
it is totally scientifically and socially inappropriate to call the stones that I work with rocks. They're not rocks. They're minerals. <laughs> rocks are a different thing. But I say that I love rocks, A, because it's easier to say that I love rocks and I like how that sounds. And B, I don't, I don't want to take myself too seriously. I know what that feels like and it's a trap. And I have taken myself too it's seriously. It's a trap. Yeah. It's a trap. So I'll say things like, I love rocks and I uh, painted with guache, guache and I won't explain myself and I've had people correct me and say, I, well, it's I will you... say I will say guache, guache until the day that I die and people and it's funny because artists that use guache will like look at me like <laughs> You know, it's not that's, how you say that's it. not how you say it. Yeah. But but I, I love doing stuff like that because it really people get so concerned like, oh, I, I, am I going to say the right thing? Am I saying it correctly? Oh, did I get your name wrong? I'm like, who fucking cares. Like, just you just go and be who you are. And if you pronounce something wrong and you're like, you know what? I actually, I like it better the way that I said it. Sure. Now I love learning stuff. So when, if I find that I'm pronouncing something wrong, uh, especially in the mineral and rocks world, um, there's a lot of chances to pronounce things wrong. I like to learn, but at the same time, I'm always going to be pretty vigilant about not taking myself too seriously. Yeah. And, and, and I think that that's, that's, that's a good point because that's where awkwardness, where like that side of awkwardness where people are like afraid of embracing their awkwardness, it's that they want to be taken seriously, right? They're like, especially when it comes to art, you guys, I've seen some really amazing, colorful artists create a website and their website looks boring as shit because they're it like, doesn't reflect I got to make sure that it looks professional you know, like I, I want to be seen as a professional artist, and I'm like, Are you, that's, I, that's, that's like every other aspiring artist out there that just wants to see be seen as a professional artist. You don't need to be seen as a professional artist. You already are an artist, right? Whether you're professional or not, that's a moot point. And like, and that's where it's like you just embrace you and the things that you like. Why, why does your website look like that? I don't know. I dig it. Mm -hmm. You know, they like that's. It's simple. Jenny says, I was born awkward as a baby and maybe still people would be around and I would be stiff as a board like a doll. I wouldn't cry. <laughs> Once someone asked my mom if I was real, I literally was born an awkward introvert. You'd think I would be better at it by now. <laughs> Ginny, I think you are I splendid. I think you're amazing. As a human, yep. just in general. Leah said that the creating, the creative writing thing, the give, the what the heck, let's give it a try, led to one of my best characters that curses like hell, but everyone loved her free speech. Still have that story I wrote, too, for that same class. I'll have to tell the larger story one day. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. You know, your dad, uh, Rafi's dad is loud and curses a lot, and he's blunt, and he has no filter. He just says whatever's in his head, even if it's offensive. Um, but he's, he's coming from such a jovial, good-hearted place that... He's almost never regarded as unacceptable or he's regarded as unacceptable, but it doesn't matter. Right. Like he's, he'll be regarded by uh, as unacceptable by people that got to stick up their butt. Sure. But, even still, but he doesn't want to talk to those people. So he doesn't care. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so your father has embraced his awkward. Now, if you asked him about it, he wouldn't see it that way. Right. He just is who he is. Right. Um, and I'm sure he's gone through his own personal evolution. Oh, he has. He has. He has. With age, he's loosened up a little bit because mm -hmm. th there used to be those situations. I think a lot of it had to do with my mom and telling him, you don't behave correctly. You got to be this way because my mom right. is somebody You're who's, embarrassing. Yeah, you're embarrassing. My mom is somebody who is very worried about what people think. And so I think over the years, um, he's just gotten to a point where he just doesn't care. Uh, he really doesn't care. I don't think he ever cared. I think he just, he was worried that he was looking inappropriate or, or whatever. And because of that, he would hold back. And the irony there is that when you hold back being who you are, then you do come off as all those things that you're worried mm -hmm. about coming off as, right? Um, and really it is just embracing that awkward, you know, kind of like what Jenny is saying, like, yeah, you want to, 
be okay with being uh, stiff as a board when yeah. people are around and use it as part of that thing. I think about us going to events and being like talking to somebody and be like, all right, I'm going to uh, clean. I are going to head out to our quiet area because it just got really busy. And like, we need to, you know, and we'll cut off a conversation with somebody and be like, we're really weird and awkward and this is getting overwhelming. So we're going to go outside. Yeah, totally. Nobody's ever had an issue with it. Unabashed awkwardness is pretty endearing. Uh, yeah. Um, I I haven't met anyone, unless they're an asshole, let's just say that, that would judge that critically. Short story. Uh, Rafi and I, a while back, went to an art opening, and there was this young man there. He was probably 16, 17, and he was clearly very awkward um, and didn't have much experience socializing. However, he was giving it his all. And like, you could tell that some of the stuff he was saying and asking was probably rehearsed before he came to the art opening. But by God, he was giving it his all. And so even though it was slightly awkward, it was so genuine and endearing. It really was. That like the interaction with him was very enjoyable because it was like, this person is, is deliberately making efforts here to come out of their shell Yep. And socialize in an environment that's clearly very uncomfortable, but they're doing it anyway. But they're doing it anyway. And they were embracing it. They were embracing totally. it. Totally. I got to talk to them later on and I was like, hey, uh, so, you know, are you are you feeling, uh, do you feel a little bit awkward or whatever like that in, in situations like this? And he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm actually extremely introverted, but I took a improv class to try and get myself out of my skin. And one of the things that they recommend is that you go to events and- And just talk. And talk, and just talk. And I was, I, there's such a level of admiration there uh -huh. for somebody that's doing something like that and being willing to be just truthful and honest about where they're coming from. Now, insecure D-bags are gonna look at somebody like that and be like, what's wrong with that guy? Uh -huh -huh -huh. Oh. But honestly, do you want those people in your social circles or is it better if those people avoid you? I would rather be avoided by those people. So it all works out in the end, in does it not? Insecure D-bags, that's a, that's a good way of describing those people. Definitely. Clover said, I stumbled over my words when the first person asked Ask me the meaning behind one of my prints. He still bought it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I can't tell you how many times I stumble over my words, even still with all the experience I have talking about my art. <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a lot of moments where I'm like, and, uh, uh, uh what's the word? <laughs> uh, what's the word? Yeah. Yeah. Jenny's like, I'm going to make a t-shirt that just says pretentious. Oh, I love it, Jenny. <laughs> that would be a fun t-shirt. Zara's <laughs> like, ha, I suggested an art critic eight ball where nothing made sense. An art critic <laughs> eight ball would be so much fun. I will always call it guache now, said Nancy. <laughs> Gobble said, I have learned that the songs I love to write don't exist if not for my long history of dark and demented psychological flounder bums. Those are all the things that we bring I love to the that. art that we create. That is perfect. Mary's like, they say that people who cuss are more intelligent, so I must be a genius. <laughs> yes, Mary. <laughs> Tish said, I think that's part of the reason I still vape. I need a reason to escape social situations where I get overwhelmed. I mean, that's why I started smoking years ago. Years ago, yeah. yeah. You, well, A, you get more breaks from your day job, and B, yes, well, yeah, you do have I an was, excuse. So I was in corporate, so yeah, yeah, I got to take like 20 breaks a day, and people that didn't smoke were like, oh, well, that's not fair. I'd be like, well, well I'm killing myself for this. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Carrie's like queen of awkward here. It seems to have gotten worse as I've gotten older. I think we, I think we learn to embrace our glorious awkwardness more as we get older, and also... I have found, and this is just my personal experience, but the generations of younger people now that are cropping up on the scene, if you will, getting born and growing into adults. <laughs> getting born. They are much more accepting of individual nuance. They're much more willing to talk about it. They're much more willing to be awkward. And they're generally more accepting of everything, which is super 
super awesome. Um, talking to, you know, they're not kids. Talking to young adults and kids. Um, this is more foreground, It's it, it, which is good. That says to me that we're heading in the right direction socially in yep. that particular way, in that particular area, where we can talk about these things, where we can share our experience, where we can be openly awkward, and that's endearing, and that's not an automatic write-off on the social hierarchy. And it is, it is really, it really is endearing, um, and you got to... Because I think what happens is a lot of people are overly concerned about what they're going to look like. Am I going to make a good impression? Am I going to, you know, and that's really kind of the way that we get set up whenever we go anywhere. Uh, when we're young with our parents, we'll behave, you know, don't ask just for don't anything. Talk. Don't talk. <laughs> you know, just be quiet. We're, we're going to so-and-so's house and they have money. So make sure that you blank, 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 blank. Don't blank, ask you know. for anything. Children yeah. should be seen and not heard. Yeah. So like, you know, you, you think about it that way. And so you put all the pressure on yourself versus understanding like this is a two way street. Like what if I get there and this person is an a-hole? Like I'm not going to, you know, just fall into place and be quiet and blah, blah, blah and all that stuff. And it's like you're you're meeting two people. I think about that because, you know, we've done art shows and gallery shows and we have had people uh, come to those shows like young artists that are extremely introverted. Like they do not leave. They, they, they want to do this thing, but they watch us on YouTube and we happen to be in the area and they come out to meet us. And I think about that because every single time, like super awkward, super quiet and timid. And so I'm just overjoyed that somebody is there that made that effort to come out mm -hmm. and meet me because I know that that's scary. It's scary to meet somebody that you think is, you know, <laughs> for some reason people think that, you know, we're, we're like up in the art world. And I'm like, you know, sometimes they come out and you, I enjoy those conversations yeah. immensely, immensely. And you just sit there and you, you have that conversation with somebody fully understanding like, oh, they're facing a fear right now. That is, that makes them a badass. Now, if I was an a-hole and they came out and I was like, I don't have time for you or anything like that. Gross. They, yeah. Then at that point, like. It's up to them to be like, this guy's an asshole. I want nothing to do with him. Mm -hmm. And But when you're going into a situation where you're feeling awkward and you're feeling like everything lands on you, chances are somebody would walk away from that situation feeling like they did something wrong. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, it doesn't work that way. It is a two-way street. And so that relieves a lot of that awkward stuff. If you go somewhere and somebody's a jerk... That's, that's on them. That's on them. And that's why also we're open about the fact, like, let's say someone does travel to a show or travel to our area to meet us and they're nervous. I'll be the first to say, I'm nervous too. Mm -hmm. It's always, <laughs> it's always nervousness inducing to meet people for the first time. It's just a fact of life. <laughs> it it um, is. And some of them are surprised that we're nervous about it, and some of them aren't surprised, but that's all part of being real with people. Yeah. Uh, it, Clover said running a D&D &D campaign and improvising there really helped me be more confident. Yeah. 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 Having to... Um, the, well, I should say not having to. The more you put yourself in situations where you have to improvise and interact with people and all that business, the more comfortable it gets. Yeah. Um, and I think the more you embrace your own awkward nuances, it's not like you don't do this and become perfect. That's not the end goal. I think you do this and you become more yourself through the process. And that's that right there. That is key because I think about it. I can speak in front of large groups of people, right? Um, in a, in a controlled environment, but that's only because I don't rehearse and I don't have a script, right? So I'm just having a conversation. I'm just being myself. So I, over the years have gotten comfortable in that kind of environment. Uh, put a guitar in my hands and wear on stage, I haven't made that connection that it's just me being up there just being myself and being comfortable with, mm -hmm. you know, m not 
being on script. Instead, in my mind, it's like, you got to rehearse this and you got to get everything right. And if you don't get everything right, everybody's going to hate you. And so that adds all this pressure. Now, the only way to really get over that is to get on stage and do it and keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. And eventually that fear of being feeling awkward goes away. Not because, oh, now I'm perfect. Everything I do on stage is perfect. But because you get you fully embrace your awkward. Yes. You embrace it. You embrace the fact that you're awkward, that you're going to make mistakes, that you're going <laughs> to not not say the right thing. And that's really the only reason that I'm comfortable having conversations with people is because I'm I'm just going to be me and I'm just going to say what I say. And if I know something, I know it. If I don't, I don't like I there's nothing rehearsed there. And I think that that's where a lot of that issue comes from. You read books like um, how to influence people and make friends and all that stuff. And a lot of it is like this very robotic thing of like you do this and then you say something like this and you make sure that you open the conversation with, hi, my name is blah, blah. How are you? Or like, what do you do for a living? That's one of the reasons that that became a standard question out there because it was actually in a course of being more comfortable talking to people as asking them what they do for a living. That makes sense. Because then you're able to assess the person, right? Because we live in a uh, in a world where it's almost like if somebody has a job, then they're here. If somebody doesn't have a job, then they're here. Who do you want to talk to, right? right. So a first icebreaker is like, what do you do for a living? I love that question personally because, you know, our answers are awkward. Uh, what do you do for a living? Oh, I, I create stuff. I remember, I'll never forget this conversation with a man at the gas station in Florida who asked, uh, you got, your jeans are interesting. What do you do for a living? I paint, said Rafi. What do you paint? Paintings. <laughs> you paint paintings? What do you mean paintings? So not like houses. No, I paint paintings. <laughs> I loved it. I paint paintings. I loved it. Tish is like, I wasn't lying. No, you I do paint, paint paintings. paintings. Yeah. If you want to meet, said Tish, if you want to meet your fellow cool, awkward peeps, hang out in the smoking section of any place. I've met my best friends there, lol. <laughs> yeah, and even if they're not smoking, often um, the introverted people will be out there just breathing <laughs> also. <laughs> Uh, Gobble said, I have a few fans and they are all right around 20 years old and they are the sweetest dang girls I have ever met or worked with. Aww, I, love, I it. love it. CJ said, I love it. This generation hug and men wear pink and it's nice to see the youth rejecting the idea that men don't cry or hug. Or oh, pink. that's so good, CJ. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Ginny said, uh, I think when you can hear... Now, I, I pre-read this and I want to read this and I want to talk about this because this is so relevant. I think when you can hear yourself talking and you're actually listening to yourself, it causes you to get really awkward and clumsy. Ignoring yourself is helpful. This is so on point that I've been wanting to do a video about this for like two years now. And um, I was going to call it the real reason that social interaction is exhausting for introverts. And here's my bad summary. Okay. My non-concise <laughs> summary. The real reason that it's exhausting to do social interaction for people like us is because we're running a background program and the background program is analyzing everything we say every moment of silence every pause our body language the body language and facial expressions of the person we're talking to and everything they say and that background program is running trying to determine if this is going okay and you know from having a cell phone that background apps drain your batteries <laughs> when they're running like that, okay? So it's actually not the social interaction itself that makes us feel tired and drained and bad. It's this background program that you're running that is analyzing every last bit of data to try and determine if this is going all right. And then you don't get a reprieve after the interaction. Because you think about it over <clears throat> and over and yep. over and over. I'm so well versed in this from life experience that I could probably write a book on it. But I want to talk about that because I think that, that that's the thing. Yeah. It's, most most definitely that yeah. that that is exhausting and it's the reason 
that, um, you know, not so much now because we've been on stage a couple times and, but the first time I was really stiff and that was because I was running a background program analyzing every strum. Oh, I missed that one. Oh man, my nail got stuck there. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. I, I can't remember the words. And so like I was completely, I, I was in the midst of having the conversation, but I wasn't in the conversation. And uh, obviously I'm talking about me playing music, but it's a in, conversation. in my mind, that's a conversation between me and the audience. But instead I was just completely focused on me and criticizing everything everything and looking at the audience's <clears throat> facial expressions and trying to um, speculate on what those expressions mean yeah you're using other people to criticize yourself just describing this process makes me feel tired <laughs> like so um Ginny puts it like learning <clears throat> how to ignore yourself or I, I guess I would say it like try learning how to switch off that background program or at least tone it down. Um, is a good practice. And step by step, how do you do that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I can say that I've learned to do it little by little as I've been in social environments more and more. Well, this might have to become a video. Yeah, it's uh, something I want to... You, you investigate it, yeah. Yeah, how does one switch off that background program or at least begin to? Um, Tish said... The best way for me to overcome my awkwardness around people is to ask them questions. Normal people do like to talk about themselves, and you get to learn about people win-win. Absolutely, Tish. Yeah. Asking questions is awesome, um, especially if you're genuinely curious about people, which a lot of creatives, I know I am, you are, a lot of creative people are genuinely I, curious and I, interested about other people. I think that the the problem is that when you're feeling, when you're feeling introverted, right, you're so hyper-focused on yourself that you're, you don't even allow yourself to be interested in somebody else, right? So mm -hmm. you're hyper-focused on yourself. I don't know what I'm going to say about myself and this and that. So it kind of, it, it, I like where the direction of this conversation is going because it really does open up the fact that like you're not in the conversation, right? You're just not in the conversation. You're totally wrapped up in yourself, lost in your own thoughts. Yeah. Um, Valerie said, I was always told as a child in the seventies that I needed to be this way or that way. And it really took until the last five years of my life until I began to embrace that I'm fine. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and the fact of the matter is that you're doing it now and you've been doing it for five years and some people never do it. They some never people, get there. Yeah. Some people never do. Some people just blame it on, well, you know, this is just how I am or this is how it is or people are like this. This is why I behave the way that I behave. And, you know, it's important to like really analyze your own belief system when it comes to that and take a look and say, like, am I happy with this? Like, and do I feel like I can't change this up for myself? And same thing for me. Uh, like I grew up, I was extremely just, you, this is how you act. This is how you whatever. And, you know, I want to throw a wrench into that programming in my in my head and, and rewrite who it is that I want to be in and, and you know, the, the final stages of my, that makes it sound like I'm dying. <laughs> We get we the get last the, portion of my life. Yeah. Maybe. Jenny said I can speak in public if there are lots of people and there's no one I know because I can't focus on someone. A small crowd or with people I know is awful because I can see faces and feel the energy. I feel you, Jenny. And oftentimes if it's a small group of people, you know, for for us, it feels like the stakes are higher. Like you should write on paper you should feel comfortable with people you know more so than strangers, but it can often feel like the stakes are higher if you already know and like those people. Like being shunned by people that you already know and like feels worse than being rejected by a big group of strangers that you could give a rip about. So it's almost like the closer you get in social circles, the harder it can become sometimes. To talk to the group. I yeah. have this anxiety <clears throat> with the rogue community, right? Um, as far as our online um, social circles and in real life social circles go, the stakes feel higher with the rogue fam because I love them. 
right? So a public live stream almost has less pressure than a private one that we do with the rogue community. It's weird, but these are all the little nuances that, that you look at. But they're the things that you, yeah, they're the yeah. things that you look at and you investigate because it doesn't make sense. You know, I, Jenny, I, I have the same issue when I'm doing a smaller group. When I did the session for um, the artist website thing, the, the, that was a small, it, it there was were 12 people there. And I found myself getting very nervous. Now, I've because I've done so many things, um, I know that when I'm feeling like that, the first thing I do is say, all right, just to let you, hi, you guys, my name is Rafi. And just to let you know, I'm probably going to screw this up. I'm going to ramble. I'm going to lose my place. I'm going to stumble over my words. Um, so let's do this thing. And right there, it's like I'm relieving a bunch of stress because I'm, putting it all out on the table like this is this is how it's going to go this is going to suck so i am going to apologize ahead of time and it's great because you know now i've set low expectations and chances are it's not going to suck and it's going to be awesome i was sitting well i did a little bit of talking during that presentation but mostly i was observing and i was because it was a small room like jenny's saying you can really feel the energy of people in a, in a scenario like that and I was um, feeling like, oh, okay, well, this guy to the right here is is confrontational. Like, he's here to like to voice the opposition mm -hmm. to what Rafi is saying about building websites. Yeah, and I think I went and, off on a rant at one yeah, point and when he said something, and then he then he was really nice. Yeah, then the energy neutralized. Yeah. It's interesting, but you can kind of gauge that, and depending on where you're coming from, it can be a hindrance or it can be it can be okay or it can be like fuel for which direction you go, but it all depends on really where you're at yeah. as the presenter. Carrie said, Tish, that's what I've always told my kids. Ask people lots of questions if you're not sure what to say. Sometimes it's hard to take my own advice because I'm so nervous. <laughs> Sarah yeah. said, I think over and over with my paintings, are they going to be perfect enough for people to not judge unfairly? Sarah, we've had this conversation yeah. about your art and worrying about people judging them. It doesn't matter. It's not unfairly. Some people are going to like it. Some people are not. You know, some people are going to like you. Some people are not. Some mm -hmm. people are going to think it's cool. Some people are going to think it sucks. So what? You did. You're going to get pulled in way too many directions, especially thinking, is it perfect? And that's exactly what we're talking about here. It's like when you go to a place, you're like, oh, I got to be I got to be on point. I got to be perfect. Or like what I say has to be right or the way that I look or the way that I dress or the way that I perform or whatever it is. And then you become hyper focused on yourself and you miss out on the opportunity of having fun. And that, you know, like Clea was saying, that's draining. That's completely draining. And for me, when it comes to art and creating art, that's one thing that I've really, really practiced out of my routine is sitting there and criticizing the work and hoping that it's perfect and being really concerned about what other people think. Because in that sense, you're getting pulled in so many different directions that you're, you're never gonna get to an end. There's no solution there. Um, so at this point, I'm like, if I like it, I like it. Screw it. It's going out there. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Zara's like, uninstall, uninstall, remove, remove program. program. <laughs> yes. Replace with new programming. <laughs> TGP Art said, I know you're talking about conversation, but this is art too. If you're always asking if the art is good, it's worse. Trust yourself. And it's always, it, honestly, it's all, whenever there is. There's no distinction, conversation, art, the art that you create, interaction with people, mm -hmm. the art that you create, the way you feel about life, the art that you create. It's all one big thing. That's why I say this isn't a job. This is a lifestyle. This is understanding, thinking a little bit more about the things that you're willing to do and capable of versus just kind of falling into the status quo, because that's really, really the expression of art. That is language. That is a language, no mm -hmm. matter if it's music or a painting or jewelry or writing or any form of art, a photography, with everything that you put out there, you are saying something. And I think that for a lot of us, we're so overly concerned about what other people are going to say about us or about the work or about, you know, what the meaning is behind it, that we don't spend any time really thinking about what we think about it or what we think about ourselves or what we think, you know, and 
It's like, don't worry about other people. They've got their own drama and shit that they got to figure out Mm -hmm. when it comes to your art or who you are or what you do. That's on them. Just know that tons of mofos are going to judge you and your work unfairly. They're, They're gonna. And that's okay. Yeah. They're out there and they're going to hate your work and they're going to think you're stupid and all of that stuff that you want to avoid. And it's okay because it has more to do with who they are than who you are. If we were concerned with any of that stuff, we would not be doing videos. No. We would not (laughs) be putting our artwork out there. Um, There is a, a list that is way too big to even go into a description of, of all the negative responses and rejection that we've gotten over the years and really it's great that that's happened because it's allowed us to really think like does this matter like do i care what this person thinks and at the end of the day the fact is what we have to say is talking about the fact that you have an opportunity you have the ability to do whatever it is that you want to do there are people that live out in the world that are pessimistic and don't think that that's a possibility, right? We live that possibility. That is our lifestyle. That is what we do. There are people out there that get really angry when you tell them that anything is possible because they have been using the fact that it's not possible as their excuse to not even try or do it. So you get out there and you start sharing your message. You're going to have people that are going to be the opposite of you. Mm-hmm. They're they're like the the negative space. You know, there are negative space versions of Rafi and Klee that live out there. They're going to hate everything that we do or talk about or make or share or anything. And that's okay. That's their life. You know, fuck it. How's it going for you? Good. Live that life. Yeah, those are those people driving down the road giving us the middle finger uh, because they hate our happy truck. <laughs> screaming out the window, yeah. I hate your truck! I hate your truck! Yeah, and I'm like, all right. And cool, man. <laughs> what's funny about that situation is that they drove by, she stuck her middle finger out or and screamed at us, hanging out of her window, I hate your damn truck! And, you know, they honked at us, so we waved. So while she was saying that, we were like, Huh? What? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Jenny was like, ha, huh, please introduce yourself and tell us about yourself. No. no. <laughs> I feel you. That is, um, so that general questions like that still to this day trip me up. Okay. And I have a story, which I won't share on this podcast about the most difficult platonic date of my lifetime with this girl that wanted to be friends with me. Oh, yeah. Um. And how I just locked up so bad because it was general questions like, tell me about you. (laughs) Yeah. And that's the problem is that some people that are awkward don't know how to interact. Their position of power, a lot of it is a power play, right? And we haven't covered that in this podcast, so we'll probably share that for another podcast. But really, there are people that that do that power play, you Mm -hmm. know, and everybody knows what a corporate power move is right it's like getting the last word and then leaving the room you know like that kind of shit um some people have these questions formed ahead of time Mm -hmm. so what are your thoughts on blah 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 you know and it's like rehearsed um i think because we've been having having open conversation for so long that like it's always very obvious to me when somebody has these rehearsed power questions and like i like fucking with them Right. So like, that's where I'm at with it. But back in the day that would have destroyed, I would have, I would have like not been sure because you feel like you're on trial. And if you feel like you're on trial, you, you lock up, you close up. And it's just that it's just too open-ended. I'm I'm, tell me about you. Please introduce yourself and tell us about yourself. Carbon based life form. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) that's why when people ask me, please introduce yourself, tell us about yourself. My name's Rafi, and I am an artaholic. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 
Valerie said, uh, Sarah said, well, I like me and sometimes I like my art. Well, that's well, going good. in the right direction. Good. You're, you're heading in that direction. Leah said, I think at this point, I just don't care what people think and I just want to make something awesome. That's Boom. a good place to Boom, be. Boom, Leah. That's perfect. Valerie said, it's super easy to take one negative comment as the truth over the thousand other positive comments you've received. Definitely, we need to reprogram that kind yeah, of thinking. Yeah, yeah and, totally. And, and Valerie, that's based on like um, danger assessment, right? So it's like mm -hmm. we tend to ruminate, especially because we're we're also trained in that way. But I think there is a biological thing where like you tend to focus on the negative stuff because you know your brain wants to avoid negative stuff. So like you ruminate on it and you're like, well, what could I have done different? You know, and so you approach it from the wrong direction um, and then you completely ignore, you know, yes, a thousand people are like, oh, I love you. Yeah, same thing happens on our videos. We'll get a thousand comments on our video about how great it was. Thank you so much. People will share their stories. It's all positive. People tell jokes and we laugh. And then there's one like. This you're is, a couple of motivational clowns. Yeah, you're a couple of motivational clowns. And I'm like, ooh, you know, it, it, it sticks in your craw. It sticks in your craw. But I think because we've dealt with it so many times that like we're at a point where I'm like, you know, I assess it. Either I'm going to respond something snarky or I just delete it. And most of the time I just delete it and block the person from the channel because I'm like, well, you're missing out because we're awesome. Mm hmm. Yeah. Ginny said, some people hate Van Gogh, some hate Da Vinci, some people hate art, some people just don't like anything. Yes. Yes. Yes, Ginny. It's yes. true. There are people that just don't like anything. Sarah yeah. said, I have a friend I call negative Nancy. Everything I say or think I would try creatively is shut down as that will never happen or is stupid or impossible. She does nothing creative or fun. So Sarah, do you call her negative Nancy? To her face. To her face. <laughs> that would be awesome. Ginny's like, tell me about yourself. I like bacon. Beautiful. <laughs> I love that response. See, you and I would be fast friends. If I was like, tell me about yourself. You're like, I like bacon. I'm like, fuck yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're friends. <laughs> CJ said, kids love my art. They see abstract, like laying on the grass, seeing dragons in the clouds. Their parents tilt their heads and look confused. I know. You know, I had one of my uh, first art shows, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, um, my ex-wife brought her, uh, friends and her husband came up and said, what was it that he said? He said, um, did your kids help you create these? Right. Did your kids help you create these? And I remember at the time I was so, there was a reason why I wasn't, uh, an artist back then or, or showing my art was because I was painfully, um, just not who I am now. It's taken a while to get to this place, who I am. But uh, I remember that really, really bothering me. And then for the rest of the evening, being embarrassed of my art. Mm. And I think back now, you know, I've had a conversation with that version of me and I'm like, yeah, man, who gives a shit? This guy is, you know, like you just sit there and you understand that like, some people are just going to speak because they think that it's funny to hear themselves say something. Mm -hmm. um, and your response really like I have a billion responses for him now. I would be like, yeah, my kids are talented. What are your kids doing? <laughs> you know, Sarah's like, I don't <clears throat> like bacon. Dun, dun, dun. Well, I'm going to call you negative Nancy. Sarah said, yes, I have called her negative Nancy, told her I was a genius, and she agreed. It was so funny. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. Jenny said, Valerie, uh, yes, so dumb. I've started saying thank you to bad comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the engagement. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, you watched the video? Thank you. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that was a great conversation, you guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with us, Rogues, for this conversation. I, honestly, the, the majority of the great content that, that is in this podcast uh, came from your comments. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's something that we're all dealing with to one level or another is, is feeling that awkward situation. And I don't think, as much as people love to um, 
make things black and white with like, well, you're either introverted or you're this or you're that. I don't think that it works that way. I think we all have areas in our lives that we have less experience in and it, we could tend to feel awkward and um, isolated in those areas. And I think the best thing to do is just put yourself in this, the situations as much as you possibly can, you know, um, to just do it, just deal with it and understand that like it's not a test. It's an ongoing thing. Mm-hmm. You know, you might get a little bit better at it here and there and you might chip away at it a little bit here and there. And to me, I'm like, I would much rather be on that journey, on this journey that I'm at now, than to use something as an excuse to not do something else. Well, I can't, I don't want to do an art show or like, I don't want to do this type of art show because I'm awkward around people. And it's like, don't do that. Don't stop yourself from the possibilities of what you could achieve simply because you're using something like that as an excuse. The way that you are is not written in stone. Being awkward is not written. In, I mean, being awkward is awesome. You embrace it because it just ultimately what it means is embracing the awkward means you're embracing who you are and what you're going to do and what you're going to say. And you're going to be OK with it. You're not going to walk away from the situation being like, oh, maybe I should have been more blah, 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 blah. And it's like, no, you don't you don't do that. Or like that voice. You're like, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Yeah. Um, Sarah says, I need to cut my toenails. Yeah. And yeah, there we go. So do I, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's a great way to end the awkward this podcast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Clee, do you have any words to leave us off on? I I think the the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> way All to right. put me on the spot, there we dude. Go. Jeez. <laughs> I think the thing that I'm going to try to remember always is that the end goal is not to become perfect at a thing. It is to become more who you are. Yeah. That's the, that's the goal. That's the goal. That's the the goal of an artist is to be more of who you are, create the things that you enjoy creating, the things that you want to see in the world, speak the things that you want to speak in the world. And that's, that's, we couldn't end this podcast on a better note. That's perfect. And thank you so much, Rogues, for being here. Thank you to everyone else for listening in to our podcast. Uh, we do a uh, podcast every week. So if you enjoy this and you want to listen to more, go ahead and subscribe. And other than that, I think it's time to say goodbye, Clee. Good day. Adios. Adios.